Hi, I'm Maggie Gunderson, President and Founder of Fairwinds Energy Education. Today, Dr. Marco Kaltofen is our special guest, interviewed for Fairwinds Featured Video. Arnie and Dr. Kaltofen will discuss nuclear waste abandonment sites around the world that are leaking radioactivity into our environment. Every day, the Fairwinds crew works hard to hold the nuclear industry and its so-called regulators accountable to people throughout the world. Many of you write to us to thank us for our work and to ask questions. Now we at Fairwinds are asking you to help us continue our energy education and atomic watchdog activities. Please help the Fairwinds crew continue this work in 2016 by pushing the donate button next to this video and by making a contribution to help Fairwinds continue its mission to move energy education forward. And now, here are Arnie and Marco. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Energy Education. And we have a really special guest with us via Skype, Dr. Marco Kaltofen um, from Boston Chemical Data in Natick, Massachusetts. Hi, Marco. Hey, good morning, Arnie. Today, I wanted to talk about radioactive waste dumps and the releases from them um, all around the country and all around the world. In the nuclear industry, we call the, the front end mining and we call the back end the, 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 what comes out of the nuclear reactor. Um, and so let's just dig right into this pile of waste, whether it's the, the new material that's in the ground as mining or the old material that's come out from the reactor. So Marco, uh, the... Uh, the, the news is alive with a fire in St. Louis. Can you tell us what you know about that? Sure. I've been working with a small group and we've been doing testing in the St. Louis area for about the past two years. We have about 350 samples that we've analyzed. And what we're looking at is the, the radioactive waste, the dross that's left over from processing uranium ore into the uranium metal used in the first nuclear weapons. So we're talking World War II era materials, the Manhattan Project. And over time, these materials have been dispersed in multiple places all over North St. Louis. Some of it ended up in a landfill, didn't belong there. Unfortunately, the landfills caught fire. And maybe the most unfortunate thing is when uranium waste decay into their byproducts, one of the things that decays into is radon, a gas. So people are concerned that the fire will approach the waste and release the radon gas into the atmosphere. So this is bomb waste that dates back from the early 1940s that wound up in a dump in St. Louis and now, what's that, 70 years later, is rearing its ugly head because an underground fire is approaching it. Did I get that right? right. Yes, you did. Uh, the waste from uranium processing actually has a, a lifetime of several hundred years. And over time, it can actually get more radioactive because the decay products are, are more radioactive than the original uranium. And that's what's happening. And unfortunately, in the 1940s, we didn't have much of a clue about what we would do with the waste from this process. So it wound up playing a game of musical chairs and moving to multiple locations around North St. Louis. I suppose at the time they originally dumped it, it was an empty area, but every city grows. And now St. Louis' suburbs, uh, Florissant, Hazelwood, Ferguson, have grown around these old waste sites, and there are far more people living next to the waste than there were when it was originally disposed of. So there's several sites in the St. Louis area, but the one that's the biggest concern is the one that there's an underground fire heading toward, right? Correct. The last place that this waste ended up was the Westlake landfill. And this landfill accepted municipal waste and it took, it took some of the, the waste from these processes and as they decay, they're releasing radon. Now when you go to the area, you can actually find radon being vented from various places. And the concern is if the fire reaches the waste, that venting is going to increase. And of course now the area is very built up. 
and lots of people live around this site. And that was the purpose of our, our study, and we eventually did submit it to a journal, and we're waiting to hear. Wow. So does anybody have any idea how to keep this fire from reaching the waste? EPA has been on the site for a few years now, and they're trying to mitigate it. They're trying to reduce the impact of both the waste and the fire. But boy, doing this after the fact is so much harder. You can spend an order of magnitude more on cleaning up a site compared to trying to dispose of it properly in the first place. And unfortunately, no one planned too far into the future when they disposed of that material. And we're basically stuck. The options are all bad ones, and they'll certainly all be expensive ones. Wow. Well, let's move on. And, uh, uh, you know, you've traveled the world chasing uh, nuclear waste issues. Um, I understand that you were in Russia, and uh, that's probably the site of one of the worst uh, nuclear explosions we've ever seen. Can you tell us about that? Back in the 1950s, there was a chemical explosion at a nuclear waste facility. So not a nuclear detonation, but a chemical one. And it caused plutonium and plutonium waste to be dispersed over an enormous area. And we call this the, the Kishtim disaster. Now, these wastes have never been cleaned up. And what the Russians are trying to do is evacuate communities ahead of the spreading waste. And what we've tried to do in our sampling and testing is, one, get a look at how much radioactivity people are exposed to and what kind of isotopes are present. We're trying to do a, a nuclear forensic analysis and see exactly what materials have now moved tens, even 100 kilometers away from the original site. So this was um, spent fuel being reprocessed? The uh, original site was, uh, you have to think about it like we did Los Alamos during the Second World War. It was a crash program. Uh, wastes were being disposed of essentially in the environment, in holding ponds, and the detonation uh, put an enormous amount of material into the environment, and it wasn't characterized. We don't actually know all the things that were in that original waste that was discharged. But we do know it came from spent fuel, so there would be things like cesium-137 remaining and, um, and other isotopes? When we did our testing, you know, we did find plutonium, we found cesium, we found strontium-90. Interestingly, we also found um, neutron activation products like cobalt-60 that we were not expecting. And we found these in, uh, in river sediments for the Tetra River. And we also found them in the, the beach area around a local swimming hole in a, a community called Muslimovo. Wow, that, that really is a, you know, for our, our listeners here, um, the fissioning of nuclear fuel creates things like cesium-137 and uh, it activates uranium to become plutonium and strontium is another one of those fission products. But, uh, but Marco mentioned this term, uh, an activation product, and cobalt-60 comes from when a, a, a neutron hits iron and becomes, uh, becomes cobalt-60. So that's a different process. Geez, that, that's fascinating. The, uh, uh, and, and of course, you guys don't know what was there to start with, so you wind up having to just you know, chase the data and go where the data take you. The Maya site, the Kishtim site, is really not all that different in some ways from some of the U.S.'s bigger sites. I mean, we can't look at Russia and say, well, they did things better or worse than we did. If we go to Hanford, uh, where I've done a good deal of testing, uh, we'll see exactly the same materials. I think the, the best thing about Hanford is the site is so enormous that most of the radioactive waste has, has not yet reached the Columbia River. Although obviously there's a lot of money and a lot of work between now and the future where we have to make sure that that doesn't get any worse. Uh, on, on Hanford, I've been uh, following that for years and I realize you've been out there many times. Um, a whistleblower had a concern that a uh, a hydrogen explosion could be could occur inside one of the tanks and blow that stuff into the air. Uh, so it's not just a leak into the groundwater, but it has the potential to volatilize and go airborne too. So the problem at Hanford, I think, is more severe than a lot of folks realize. The first priority at Hanford 
is to clean up the mess that Hanford made back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. In fact, that's the only priority at Hanford. This is all Hanford does. Hanford cleans up Hanford. And we're going to spend more on the cleanup than we spent on creating all of the original plutonium, uranium, and thorium that was going to be used for weapons production. So we have a variety of different sites that are heavily contaminated with probably the most concentrated, most radioactive, and most poorly characterized nuclear wastes in the United States. We're fortunate that the site is large, it gives us some buffer zone, Obviously, this doesn't apply to the people who work at Hanford. The people who work at Hanford, as they try and maintain the lid on these different wastes, often find themselves exposed not just to the radioactive materials, but to all the chemicals that were originally disposed of and all the new chemicals that are created by exposure to these high radiation fluxes. Uh, it's an enormous problem for us. We're spending billions of dollars on a waste treatment plant at Hanford. It's badly needed, but after all these years and all these billions, it actually hasn't treated a single gallon of waste. And it is uh, not clear when that treatment is even going to start. So it is easily as intractable as the problem that the Russians have had with Mayak and the Kishtim disaster site. Um, I wanted to talk about legacy sites, yeah. You, you know, all of these sites, uh, uh, the, the WIP one is handing legacy waste from bomb programs. The, uh, uh, of course, the one in Russia and, and, and Hanford have uh, legacy wastes. And the, the Beatty, Nevada site was handling commercial waste, but, but from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and, 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 and who knows uh, what's, what's underground to any of those. The, the one I would like to add to this mix is West Valley in upstate New York. That was a commercial fuel processing plant, um, several power, power plants ship waste to West Valley on the theory that it would be reprocessed. And the, um, the, the, the chemical systems are incredibly complicated and uh, incredibly radioactive. I, I had a team of people that were there uh, back in 1980, 81, and we were chartered by the company that got the legacy site, a company called NYSERDA. Um, to, um, to, to survey the site for radiation. And our guys had experience in power plants and they were just appalled at the radiation levels. Through, through four and five foot thick walls, they were still picking up hundreds of millirem an hour. Then we also went outside and uh, we were uh, doing an environmental study and we found plutonium in the parking lot. And the source of that was, as it turned out, the, they would drive in to the, uh, these hot cells um, forklifts. And the forklifts, when they came out, were contaminated, and they would park the forklifts in the parking lot, and the rain would wash the plutonium off. Um, so it seems like uh, around the country, we've done a really poor job of managing the back end of the, of the nuclear fuel cycle. I have to agree. When I look at the results of my research, uh, doing dust analyses, doing residential sampling, uh, looking for things like americium, plutonium, uranium, thorium. Uh, these are things that are, have a natural component, but they're also related to nuclear weapons or, or nuclear energy um, facilities. Over and over again, I am finding plutonium and americium in house dust, in the homes of people who are either next to places like the Rocky Flats Nuclear Arsenal, in Rocky Flats, Colorado, or who worked at those facilities. And the issue there is, you know, when you're at your workplace, you're taking care not to be exposed to radiation. But if you bring that home on your clothing, uh, in the dust that's in your, your, your vehicle, and you can bring that into your house, you're exposing yourself more, but you're also exposing family members, people who really were never trained and never expected to encounter nuclear material. And I'm going to bring up something that's going to make this more complex. In my research on looking for traces of the Fukushima explosion, in house dusts around the United States and Canada, what I kept finding was our own domestic wastes from our legacy sites usually dwarfed the amount that we found coming from Japan. 
So there was a lot of concern and a lot of attention about radioactive dust from Japan, and if you work hard, you can find it. But what it ignored was these legacy sites that we created ourselves actually have a bigger contribution, a larger exposure to most people. And you can actually look at house dust from Los Alamos, New Mexico, or Richland, Washington, next to Hanford, or around Rocky Flats, Colorado, and you can actually see the physical evidence of what were once classified nuclear processes that caused radioactive waste to get into the surrounding homes. It was a, a major disappointment and it's something that we really don't understand from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, that, that's really frightening and the horse is out of the barn. There's no way to get that material back in the, uh, in the ground or, or, or wherever it belongs. You know, the, the back end of the fuel cycle is what we focused on so far, and I'd like to close by talking about uh, the front end of the, of the uh, fuel cycle. Uh, there's, uh, that's the, when uranium is mined, it's really a low percentage of the rock in which it's placed, and it has to be uh, separated out, usually with acids, and, uh, and, then, and then processed um, into something called yellow cake, which then gets processed again and enriched and finally works its way into a nuclear reactor. But the two front end steps of that, the, uh, the digging it out of the ground and stripping out the uranium with acids is, is, uh, creates something called mill tailings. And I was um, recently in, in Utah testifying and um, a very near a site called Moab. And at the Moab site, the um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission told the owner of the site that they needed to uh, put up a six million dollar decommissioning fund and the site cleanup has actually now exceeded a billion dollars. So it's taxpayers that are on the hook for that. Um, but the good news is the pile of waste stayed intact. Um, the, the Native Americans I work with will tell you uh, loud and clear that the worst release of total amount of radiation into the uh, uh, into the uh, environs was at a place called uh, Church Rock and uh, that was a 20-foot uh, breach in a dam that allowed um, acidic water containing uh, lots of uranium mill tailings to enter a river and, and contaminate 70 miles of river largely on uh, Navajo reservations. It happened about three months after Three Mile Island and of course the combination of um, Three Mile Island and the fact that it happened to Native Americans in an unpopulated area uh, where news trucks couldn't get to very easily meant that it was not very well covered in the press, but it was still and still remains an environmental disaster. Have you taken any looks at, at um, mill, mill tailing sites, Marco? I actually have been to those sites. I've collected samples and analyzed them. There are a few problems that we run into. You know, one is a technical problem. Uranium and thorium exist naturally in the earth. and We obviously mine them, refine them, and, and create materials from them. So you always have to be careful about measuring the difference between what's naturally present and what's been caused by industry. And that actually is not that difficult as long as you're using the proper tools. But it does get complicated in working with uh, the regulatory agencies where there is a tendency to say, well, it's a natural material, uh, it's not our fault, it was there even if we hadn't done this. And of course, like any mining activity, you know, arsenic is natural, we mine it, we expose people to it. It's our responsibility to do it carefully and not expose members of the public. And unfortunately, if you talk about legacy, we have a really bad legacy of how we have allowed First Nation peoples, uh, the Navajos and others, uh, to become exposed to some of the most radioactive materials as miners because many of these Native Americans were working in the mines and also in their homes where their groundwater supplies have been contaminated by uh, mine tailings and mining waste and they're also exposed to radioactive dusts and gases. And I think it's a real American tragedy that we haven't faced up to this cost. You know, we do it in other industries where when we're working with hazardous materials, and, and I'll pick petroleum, you know, we work with gasoline, which is toxic, dangerous, explosive, but we spend the money, 
and we do it right and the vast majority of the time we do it without incident and use the product. Well this just hasn't happened with First Nation people and uranium mining. Uh, we have not spent the money. We have not done the things we can to prevent exposure to radioactive materials to the workers and to their families. I think most people do not recognize that the largest radioactive release in the history of the United States was the release of uranium contaminated mine tailings to First Nation people in the Navajos. And we have just got such a long way to go. Even if we were to develop perfectly safe, perfectly clean nuclear power plant, we still have to worry about the cost to the miners. I think we understand that coal mining, uh, uranium mining are hazardous occupations, but they're only this hazardous because we allow it to happen. You know, if, if there's a common thread here from the, the front end of the cycle and the back end of the cycle, it, it seems to me it's that, that what I've been saying to our viewers for a long time about Fukushima cleanup, and that's the, the issue of follow the money. It, it seems like we, you know, we'll, we take the profit early in the game, but we never really uh, set aside enough, uh, enough money to do the uh, appropriate cleanups after the fact. Well, if I'm just speaking as a lifelong engineer, I think the mistake we made with the nuclear industry happened early. We treat it, treated it as if it were a special industry. It was insulated from some of its liabilities, and therefore it didn't take the necessary steps to protect uh, its own workers early on, and it didn't make that part of its culture. And I don't think it was so much a technical problem as it was an economic one. Once relieved of the economic burden, you know, what corporation will want to take it back willingly? Well, I guess that's the takeaway for this entire, uh, entire video, Marco, and I wanted to thank you for, uh, for giving us the time today to, to talk about this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Marco Kaltofen in Massachusetts. If you believe in Fairwind's mission of speaking truth to power by educating the true risk of nuclear energy in the hope of a safer, cleaner, greener power tomorrow, please visit our website, fairwinds.org, and make a donation today. We need your help to keep you informed. Thank you.